Okay, I'm gonna look at three things. The budget and what changes it bore, tax day, 23rd of March, and the consultations and what changes, if any, they bore. And what we might expect in light of those two developments, what we might expect in the next budget this autumn. And then of course, what all of that might mean for financial planning. So first, the budget. Seems like history, doesn't it now? But there are a few things we need to remember. First, it gave us a really good in indication of the pathway that the Chancellor is proposing or is actually taking in relation to the repayment of government debt. Now, you'll remember, who can forget? Government debt is really high, which is what gives rise to that almost constant question you see in the news and sometimes from your clients, I'm sure, how are we going to repay this debt? What is the amount of debt? Well, it's 2.3 trillion. That's the total amount that the country owes at the moment, largely in unredeemed gilts, okay, 2.3 trillion. That equates, by the way, to the amount that we produce in a year, where our GDP is in a single year, the amount we produce as a country in total in goods and services. Deficit is a different thing. That's the difference between what we get in as a country in a year, largely through taxation, and what we pay out, what we spend, mostly this year on supporting the economy, individuals and businesses, uh, through the pandemic. And that stands at around 400 billion, that's just slightly less than that. So that was the background. And we also had some guidance effectively from the International Monetary Fund, the OECD, most of the G20 countries are going, actually, we probably don't need to do anything immediately. It'll be the wrong thing to start hiking up taxes right now while we're still trying to get the economy back and running. And we'll be getting the economy back and running and thriving for a little bit longer, I suspect, of course. So basically, the, the focus was more on economic support, and will continue to be, and we've got evidence for that now, on economic support, rather than immediate, quite important to bear that in mind, immediate tax rises. Okay, so what did we get in the budget? Lots more support. I won't dwell on it too much. There's a lot of coverage on this within TechLink, uh, the support piece. So there's the job retention scheme, the furlough scheme that's being continued now through to September. Some changes made in July and August to, to have greater employer contribution towards that. So whilst your furlough payment will remain at 80%, the company, your employer, will have to contribute 10 and 20% to that. Um, we've got the self-employed income support scheme being continued. And for the first time, those who submitted tax returns in the 1920, 2019, 2020 tax year can claim for the first time on the fourth and fifth grants. And again, a little more of a test on the fifth grant to see that your profits have actually dropped and you can prove that. Bear in mind also, if you're claiming that grant, that you, you will or should be prepared to prove that you have been detrimentally affected by COVID. Um, we've got the business, um, the business recovery loan scheme, which replaces the Sybils and the bounce back loan, slightly less attractive, but still reasonably attractive. Um, that's with us. That's taking over from the, the time that the Sybils and bounce back loan ceases. Uh, we've got help for the mortgage market. Of course, we've got business rates holidays continuing as well. Help for the, the house buying market through the mortgage guarantee scheme and the continuation of the stamp duty holiday on the first £500,000 of a purchase through to the end of June. And then it drops that, that free bit to 250,000, which is of course half, but still double the amount that it started at at 125,000. And that carries through to September. So again, help for the housing market. So lots of that help going on. There's other stuff as well, but we'll concentrate now on the two bits that caught the attention, individual taxation and corporate taxation. So the chancellor actually did take a step towards repaying government debt, being a little tougher on, on taxes, but by no means as tough as he sort of could have been, but if he had been, then he would have harmed the economy, so he wasn't going to do that. So these two changes to individual and corporate taxes had similar characteristics, and they do nothing very much right now, but over time, so over time, they will contribute quite meaningfully towards debt repayment. Okay, so the first thing was individual taxation. What happened there? Nothing immediately really, except that we had the freezing of many of the allowances and exemptions and thresholds, importantly, for personal taxation. So when you look at income tax, you'll, you'll remember, you may remember way back just before the election in the Tory manifesto, there was a promise not to increase the rate of income tax, capital, uh, income tax, national insurance or VAT. So that promise 
the Prime Minister sees as an important one, so he's sticking with that. So how else can you get more money out of the three main tax generators and, and, and income tax in particular? Here's a way, something that they've done before, so-called stealth tax, which is freeze allowances and thresholds. So they've frozen the personal allowance at its 21, 22 level. That's been frozen. So it went up a bit, 70 pounds, I think, and then it's frozen until the end of 25, 26, the 25, 26 tax year. Okay. The threshold for higher rate tax went to its proposed 21, 22 level you know, from 6 of April this year at 50,270. But then it's frozen through until the end of 25, 26. The capital gains tax exemption, 12,300, frozen till 25, 26. Uh, the inheritance tax threshold and nil rate band um, and the residence nil rate band, all frozen. So all of those things are completely frozen. I mean, tax planners and myself would say they should have just let it go, let it go, but they haven't, it remains frozen. So what does that mean? There will be, most importantly, there will be more higher rate taxpayers, which means that I think, pretty sort of plodding assumption this, but if there are more higher rate taxpayers, there are likely to be more people requiring tax advice or help with their tax planning, because the more painful something gets, the more people look for relief from that pain, and you're the people to give them that relief effectively from higher rates of tax with the many things that you can do. And of course, we didn't see any changes to the amount that you can put into ISAs, junior ISAs, pension contributions. Okay, with pension contributions, the, um, the lifetime allowance was frozen at that figure, somewhat over a million, and I can never remember. I need to speak to Claire Trot for that one, or look at Tetley. Um, so basically on the personal tax front, nothing really has changed apart from stuff being frozen. That will mean actually, um, by the time we get to the end of 25, 26, one in six of all taxpayers will be higher rate or additional rate taxpayers. Okay, and hopefully they're all your clients. Um, and that means it's 11% of all adults will be higher or additional rate taxpayers. So that's what to look forward to. I can't imagine tax is going to get simpler or easier for individuals in that period just going forward. The need for personal financial planning tax advice is going to absolutely continue. So how about businesses? The main change there was that scheduled increase to corporation tax. So scheduled from when? Well, from the 1st of April 2023. So again, deferred pain. By the way, those personal tax changes are estimated to yield a constant, of important, a constant eight billion pounds a year, even from the date they're frozen, because it kind of locks in that saving and the greater number of people that are higher rate tax, that's eight billion. Another chunk of money will be generated by the new corporate tax rate, if it gets implemented, because remember all these, these things when they're pushed into the future could change if the economy bounced back amazingly and it was closer to the election, we might not see this increase to the corporation tax rate, which I've just said will apply from the first of April 2023. So what is the higher rate? 25% is 25%, which is over a 30% increase on the current rate, 19%, but it only applies to profits in excess of 250,000, or it, more accurately, it will only apply to profits in excess of 250,000. Okay, how about profits less than that? Well, profits less than um, 50,000 will bear the 19% rate, the current rate. And in between that, we will have a sliding scale in effect, you know, that marginal relief. When we had previously the small companies rate and the main companies rate, we had marginal relief in between, where there was an effective imposition of a higher rate than the standard rate to drag the average up gradually to that higher 25%. So that's potentially going to happen, is intended to happen in the future, 2023. What's happening now, the ability to carry losses back for three years, losses made in accounting periods ending between the 1st of April 2020 and the 31st of April 2022. Losses made in that period can be carried back three years rather than the one year. And also the wonderfully named super deduction. So that is if you make expenditure uh, on qualifying plant and machinery, wide definition, that includes computer equipment, uh, by the way, 130% of what you spend will be deductible for tax purposes. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean you get 130% of your 
expenditure back fully in tax pound for pound. It means 130% of what you actually spend can be set up against your otherwise taxable profits. So if for every 100 pounds you spend in your tax computation, the company's tax computation, you'll be treated as having spent 130 pounds. Now that, so that means you will get tax relief of 19% of 130 pounds, not 90% of 100 pounds. So your tax relief will be 24.7 pounds, 20, 24 pounds seven and 70p. So almost 25p in the pound, even though you're paying a 19% tax relief, it kind of gives you the tax relief that you would get if you were a 25% tax paying company. Okay. So there are the changes to business. What does that mean? Well, nothing really from a business standpoint right now. It just reminds us that tax is important. Tax is important to individuals and it's pretty front of mind at the moment. So make sure that you have your front center and back or front back and center of those conversations with your corporate clients on how to extract money most tax efficiently. By the way, of course, if we do get that increase to corporation tax to 25%, it makes dividends not less attractive than salary because you do save the national insurance on it on salary with salary over salary but it does mean that the margin of difference will shrink further because dividends by definition are of course after tax profits they are paid out of after tax profits and reserves so that diminishes it will diminish further the difference between dividends and salary going forward of course also be right at the center of that discussion a really important one that is sometimes missed of why are you in business? What's your purpose? And, and if your purpose is to eventually take the capital value of that business to exit and get the capital value with a capital event, then bear in mind the fact that you need to be constructing your business, be super intentional to make the business be viable by a, you know, a third party. It may be incredibly valuable to you, however you value your business emotionally or financially. But it's got to be valuable to someone else for you to realize that money. And there are certain characteristics a business needs to have to acquire that value to somebody else. So be in the center of that. If, of course, you're thinking, I don't really like what I do and I'm going to carry on doing it. And that's great. It's going to be a great source of revenue to me. Brilliant. Factor it into your plans because your goals for the financial assets that you need to accrue to have the continued future that you look for will need to be slightly less because you've got another asset. Your business is going to keep churning out money. However, however, of course, that comes with risk. Will you still feel that way in 20 years' time when you're going to start to just, when you'll start to be older, you'll actually be older. Um, and the risk of, well, what if you get ill? We've all become much more conscious of that over the last year. Um, what if you die? Even worse, the importance of risk and taking care of it and the reassurance, both financial and emotional, you get by doing that, taking care of risk, should you not get there. So the risk of dying, the risk of being ill and having appropriate insurance in place. I know we've talked about that on many occasions. Right, okay, so they are the changes in budget. So we then had, what we were saying is, a budget of two halves. What do you mean by that? Well, budget itself in early March, and then the budget, um, it was third of March, wasn't it, yeah? And then the budget, and the, uh, sorry, the tax day, so-called tax day, where the consultations were being issued on the 23rd of March. Now, the Treasury said, we think this is important anyway, not because we want to hit you with a big surprise, defer the gratification of all your news till the 23rd. It was just, it makes sense, right? Because when you have the budget, it should be about stuff that's being done for this year and will be in this year's finance bill. And stuff we're gonna talk about and think about because it needs a bit more thought. We used to pile the whole lot out on one day. They said, didn't actually use those words, but that's what they said. And uh, we're going to issue those consultations a little bit later, 20 days later on the 23rd, tax day. So we've had that. What did we get? Because that was, we could get all the consultations around the bigger tax. What's going to happen with capital taxes, capital gains tax, inheritance tax? How about more broad tax, the business taxation? How about taxation of employment? You've seen those decisions on uber probably deliver to come you know the nature of the relationship between the supplier of the, of the the goods and the people that sort of do the delivery do the execution of that supply is it self-employed or is it employer employee if it is what are the consequences for tax that whole thing to review employment income or income from work so will, will we get that and as it turned out we didn't get any would there be pension changes there's always a question what about pension changes we know it's it's harder than it might seem at first sight. 
Uh, so it needs consultation. So that's what we could be expecting on the 23rd. And then what we actually got was pretty much none of that actually on the 23rd. So that's still waiting. That budget of two half, the second half was a bit of a damp squid, etc. Uh, you might think. Well, you might think it was actually if you're looking for big tax change. I just remind myself of some of the change off this bit of paper I got here. Yeah, okay, right. Um, they dealt mostly with timely payments, raising standards, simplifying inheritance tax, tackling non compliance, and taxation of trusts. There was a word on that, and raising standards in the advice market. So, broadly, they were, of course, it's falling off. They were pretty pleased with themselves saying, look, the tax gap is about 4%. That's the difference between what the government should get in if it applied the tax legislation perfectly and what it actually gets in. Uh, and that's not bad. They've really worked hard to diminish that gap. But they're going to do further work to make sure that tax avoidance doesn't work. Aggressive tax avoidance, not tax planning, tax avoidance. OK, so they will be coming down hard on promoters of what they even harder. I should say, on promoters of what they like to call aggressive tax avoidance schemes. Um, so that's something they'll be doing, something that doesn't affect any of you. Um, looking at tax administration, then they have clearly locked onto the importance of cash flow, as any business does. HMRC, sort of UK PLC have done the same. We've seen it in corporate world, and they are very keen through the Making Tax, dig tax Digital initiative um, to ensure that the tax payment dates are going to be accelerated. So there's consultation and work going on around that. So any income, the tax on any income that you receive that is through self-assessment or through your business, there will be a shrinking of the time between you earning your money and paying the tax. You know there's a bit of a deferment in time between earning the money and then paying it. Under, with any aspects of self-assessment, that's going to be shrunk to make it more real time. Okay. I mentioned trusts. There was a consultation on trusts in 2018. Um, we made some representations actually, and then it went utterly quiet. It was sort of tumbleweed following that. Well, tumbleweed's just come around the corner and oh, there it is. And what are they doing? Nothing. They said, no, actually, we've looked at trusts and it's all right. Taxation of trusts is okay. We'll keep it generally under review, but trusts are okay, which was a big tick, really. So carry on using trusts. Uh, no change proposed there. A piece on raising standards, which will apply to anyone giving tax advice as a consultation on first to get a clear definition of what tax advice is. We'll just quote from this because in the financial planning world, it says a financial advisor who in the course of providing investment advice to a client advises on the most tax efficient way to invest is giving tax advice. Okay, they, they throw up for consultation the difference between advice and guidance. But the consequences of that are likely to be that you will need some form of appropriate um, professional indemnity insurance if you are giving tax advice. But that's consultation to take place. And the other thing that grabbed the attention was inheritance tax simplification. Ah, oh, so there's the change to inheritance tax. Well, not really. It was just to administration. Apparently, well, only 5% of estates their inheritance tax, and yet nearly 50% of estates, the personal representatives managing those estates, have to fill in all the forms necessary. And yet only 5% of them actually end up with tax. So you've got loads and loads of people, hundreds of thousands of people filling in fairly detailed tax, and even worse, under the reporting system for inheritance tax, it can't be done digital. It mostly has to be done by printing stuff off. And you all know how you feel about that. Oh, no, I've got to print something off, write on it, and put it in an envelope. So basically, shrinking that down to say, actually, what we want to get to by 2022 is only estates that have to pay tax have to fill in the forms, broadly speaking. There'll probably be a few exceptions, but on the whole, let's get rid of the need to fill in all the forms if you don't have to pay tax. So that's something else that is going on. They were the main changes <coughs> that were referenced on tax day. So they're the main, there are lots of other consultations, but they were the main ones that had any even tangential references to financial planning. So what could we expect in the next budget? So if we've got a game of two halves, the next budget is kind of extra time. And we just hope there's no penalties. Okay, right. So what we're looking at when we come to probably November is maybe, a little more clarity on what the economy looks like, maybe. And if we have, 
and we have the confidence in that and interest rates remain low and we can continue to service the debt because that is relevant to the servicing of government borrowing, then we might seek some further consultations or actions around capital taxation, maybe even on pensions, it does cost 40 billion a year. So what we have right now is a lead up to that period where you can really engage with your clients really closely to ensure that they're aware of what's gone on, aware that nothing really has changed, the planning remains with us. Um, the new tax year, great time to sort of spring clean your finances and get really clear about what your strategy is going forward and keeping an eye on what might happen in the future. Remember, we have those two Office of Tax Simplification reports on capital taxation. We have the one on the inheritance tax, a small part of which has been picked up on and acted on, and they were issued back in 2018, 2019. That IHT administration point was picked up on by the OTS and said, you really need to deal with this. And they have, or started to at least, through that tax day consultation. Okay, but with regard to um, capital gains tax, this chancellor, the current chancellor, asked the OTS to look at that. And that schedules or, or reports on sort of recommendations that you could look at linking or taxing capital gains as income, removing the rebasing of capital gains on death. It talks about possibly removing or at least toughening up the conditions for business assets disposal relief. That's the time, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs relief as it used to be called, possibly even reducing the annual CDT exemption. So a lot of scheduled or recommended, not scheduled, recommended changes by the OTS to think about, which might be part of consultation when it comes to the next budget. That could really change your investment decision making in relation to where you place your investments. It will make the tax efficiency of ISAs and pensions even more so, accelerate them effectively, may even bring investment bonds more back into favour than they currently are, because they aren't currently in favour, generally speaking. They've been overtaken by unwrapped collectives. But let's not forget, while we're on the subject of how investment bonds can be very powerful to defer taxation to a time when your tax rates are lower, and then the extraction possibilities through using top slicing relief and 5% withdrawals. When you've invested such as to use up all your main tax no-brainer exemptions, and when you've invested to use your dividend allowance and your CGT exemption through collective investments. When you go beyond that, the bond can have a place to play. So where does all of that leave us? Yeah, we've got clarity on how we can plan now. There could well be further changes. You'd expect there to be because the corporate tax change and the personal tax change is largely freezing and deferred tax increase are gonna contribute somewhat. Economic recovery is definitely gonna contribute, be the main contributor because it generates activity and that generates taxation. Um, but we've got potentially more change to come. So at the moment, my recommendations, my calls to action are number one, number one, this is the foundation to both of these calls, is be informed, keep up to date with what's going on, all those sort of small marginal bits of extra information you get that you store, really, really useful in delivering that all important trust that your client wants. Because with that information and knowledge, you can do two things. You can react better when they ask you a question. Oh, that scheduled increase to corporation tax. Those super deductions, how do they work? They're not directly to do with what you do now, I agree. But if you go, oh, I don't really know, that doesn't position you as the advisor that someone really trusts. Or the, you know, if you're working with a professional connection, to know that stuff is really important because it will enable you, number two call to action, to be more proactive with that information, not just boring people to death. Like, did you know there's a super fund deduction? Someone who hasn't even run, hasn't even got their own business. But you know what I mean? To actually operate on a saw this and thought of you basis. If you have that mindset, then when a change occurs that you read about or hear about or see a video about, then you can think, oh, who of my clients is that, is that relevant to? I could just tell them and just, I just thought you might be interested in that. Sort of reaching out to them with a piece of information that's relevant to them, not bombarding them, but it's really, really important that. So I think be informed, be able to react better and be proactive.